Welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Author Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is taking care. We're celebrating different ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our upcoming schedule at WAB. Org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function. Books are available through our bookstore Ampersand Books. I'll put the link in the chat. We're so excited to have Laura Warren Hill with us this evening. First we'll hear her read, then she'll be in conversation with Kimberly Brown. Kimberly Brown is an educator and a teacher leader in the Rochester City School District, where she currently teaches middle school English. She is also an adjunct professor at St. John Fisher College. A dedicated advocate for social justice and equity in education and the community, she is an advisor for Penfield High School's Black Student Union. On July 24, 1964, chaos erupted in Rochester, New York. Laura Warren Hill's Strike the Hammer examined the unrest, rebellion by the city's Black community, rampant police brutality, that would radically change the trajectory of the civil rights movement. Laura Warren Hill examines Rochester's long civil rights history and drawing extensively on oral accounts of the community offers rich and detailed stories of the area's protest tradition. Laura Warren Hill is associate professor of history at Bloomfield College. She is the co-editor of The Business of Black Power and has published in Journal in the Study of Radicalism and Journal of African American History. Laura, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely, thank you, Dan, for having me. I appreciate it. And thank you, Kimberly, for your willingness to be in conversation with me about this book tonight. I guess if you would like me to go ahead and get started, uh, yeah, I, will, I will give the first words to uh, Frederick Douglass. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what a people will submit to and you have found out the exact amount of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Frederick Douglass uh, gave these, these words in his West India Emancipation Day speech in 1857. When I started working on this project, I realized that I knew an awful lot about Rochester in the 19th century, but I knew very little about the history of activism in the 20th century. And I think importantly for this project, this is a history of activism in Rochester. And so I, I wanna be clear that as often as possible, I use the words of those activists, I use the recollections of those activists, and I have used the documents of those activists. So I am forever indebted to those people, um, many of them who are cited in the book for their willingness to share their lives and their experiences with me. So this book is a story of transformations wrought by an event that happened on July 24th, 1964 in Rochester, New York. On that day, the city's black community erupted in rebellion, the suppression of which required calling up of the National Guard. Barely a week earlier, another uprising had taken place in the fabled black Mecca of Harlem. The rebellions in both places, Rochester and Harlem, shared a common spark, police brutality and misconduct, which would also be true of subsequent uprisings in that era. The events on the opposite side of New York State happened at a critical moment in the modern African-American experience. To some, the timing seemed incongruous. At the beginning of the same month as the back-to-back -back uprisings, July 1964, the first major legislative achievement of the civil rights movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, had come into effect. The twin rebellions in New York State in 1964 were a foretaste of what was to come as the Southern-based civil rights movement, fresh from its legislative victories, 
The Civil Rights Act would be followed, of course, by the equally consequential Voting Rights Act of 1965, gave way to a different kind of Black political mobilization centered largely, although not exclusively, in the urban North. The civil rights movement had dismantled Jim Crow as a system of legalized racism, with consequences that were more immediately evident in the South than in the North. The new Black political mobilization, building on the energy arising from the rebellions and fashioning theories of a Black political economy, sought to address the structures of socioeconomic marginalization and impoverishment that survived the legal dismantling of Jim Crow in the North as well as the South. From this standpoint, the perceived incongruous incongruity of explosive rebellions in Black communities hard on the heels of the legislative victories advancing Black rights was more apparent than real. Rochester emerged as an important laboratory and national model in the transition from the old to the new. This too seemed incongruous, yet belying stereotypes, casting it as a nondescript municipality on the northern edge of the lower 48, perched on one side of Lake Ontario and with Canada on the other side, Rochester became a key center in the new black political mobilization. It was an indeed a probable and improbable achievement. To begin, Rochester was not a major urban center. In 1960, it ranked just 38 among the nation's cities by population, behind Long Beach, California, and Birmingham, Alabama. Nor did Rochester have a black majority or anything close to it. The city's black population, while growing, stood at just 7.4% of the total in 1960. Again, Rochester did not conform to preconceptions of where and why Black uprisings occurred, any more than it seemed emblematic of the Black freedom struggle in the 20th century. For those reasons and more, the events in Rochester have been variously mischaracterized when they have not been ignored altogether. Even so, Rochester rose to the forefront, where it led, other urban centers would follow. As a result of the rising in Rochester, a newly energized African-American community used the public outpouring of discontent to launch one of the most innovative and largely uncharted campaigns for black freedom in the 20th century. In so doing, black Rochester became a national leader in the quest for the new black political economy in the black power moment. Rochester ministers and community activists spearheaded two developing tendencies within black power. The first, Black theology, was closely related to the second, Black economic development. That the two, Black theology and Black economic development, emerged in Rochester is not surprising given the city's deep history of multi-pronged and closely related social movements, including abolition, as personified by Frederick Douglass, women's rights, as, personi as personified by Susan B. Anthony and Harriet Tubman, and even the social gospel as personified by Walter Rauschenbusch. Furthermore, Rochester was home to a radical socialist tendency most oft often associated with people such as Emma Goldman. If Black, Black Rochester was hot in 1964, it was in part because it was heir to a long local history of striking back against the twin pillars of inequality and injustice in the context of the larger national and global struggle for freedom. So this book shows how Black activists in Rochester used the uprising and the fear of Black violence to make increased demands on the city and to launch new kinds of movements. To pursue economic development in their communities, participants in the Rochester movement privileged Black capitalism. This book places the reemergence of Black capitalism firmly within the Black power tradition in a way that few movement histories have done. The Rochester movement explored the economic possibilities of Black capitalism as a movement tactic and contested its meaning and value in the age of Black power. Traditionally, Black freedom activists, particularly from the civil rights era, have been understood largely in their role as consumers rather than producers. This, of course, is explained by the popularity of boycotts in the South. This book takes seriously, however, the producer impulse that emerged with Black capitalism. At the time, many proponents of Black capitalism advanced an individualistic rather than a collectivist agenda. Consequently, 
many in the movement dismiss black capitalism as antithetical to its larger goals. As a strain within the black power movement, black capitalism continues to be dismissed as a reactionary venture devised by a Republican president, Richard Nixon, to blunt the black power movement. Yet many in Rochester saw the promise of collective empowerment, dignity, and equality within capitalism, challenging notions of what it meant to be radical or to seek radical change or liberation, and hearkening back to a longer nationalist impulse. And so this book attempts to recover the populist stories of both corporate responsibility and the revived pursuit of Black capitalism that sprung up in the era of Black power. At its core, Rochester's foray into Black power was decidedly economic. Leaders and followers, traditional and militant alike, sought to improve the economic conditions of African Americans, most notably among the poor. In so doing, they pioneered strategies and forms of protest that came to be modeled across the nation, challenging perceptions that Black capitalism was antithetical to the Black freedom movement. And so, uh, I wanna sort of move ahead here um, to, to sort of just outline real quick, one of the other, I think kind of interventions or interesting things that this book does is to tell the story of the, the Christian ministers in Rochester who adopted black power as their methodology or their organizing framework. And so each chapter of the book tells the story of a crucial moment in the formation or the development of Black Rochester in the latter half of the 20th century. Chapter one charts the emergence of a sizable Black population in the city. This Black Renaissance began not in the city center, but in the fields and orchards surrounding the city, an agricultural belt responsible for growing a significant portion of the nation's food supply. As World War II sapped the nation's labor supply, local white ag agricultural workers abandoned the fields for better paying factory jobs in Rochester, Buffalo, and Syracuse, creating a labor shortage in the fields. Consequently, farmers turned to places like Sanford, Florida, and to the East Coast migrant stream, which brought Black agricultural migrants along with their cultures and customs from the depths of Florida through the Carolinas and Virginia, and then into New York State. Over time, many of the agricultural migrants would leave the stream, opting instead to put down roots in the north, with Rochester becoming a popular destination. This new influx of Black migrants created a demographic shift, the likes of which Rochester had never seen before. At the start of the century, the city's Black population consisted of 601 people, less than half of 1% of the total. A slow trickle continued until, until 1940 when the real boom began. Uh, between 1940 and 1970, the black population increased from 3,000 to nearly 50,000. The city leaders refused to acknowledge the strain this demographic shift had put on the seventh and third wards where Rochester's black population was concentrated. African Americans, new and old, agricultural and otherwise, were relegated to living in these two city wards, long designated migrant neighborhoods that simply were not equipped to house so many people. Redlining and restrictive covenants kept them from settling anywhere else. It was this unprecedented influx that gave rise to a group of Black activists known as the Young Turks, who helped to elect a Black, a black woman, Constance Mitchell, as ward supervisor. Mitchell's election marked a significant change in Rochester politics. The coordination it required signaled a new dedication to civil rights organizing and protests in the city. It also overturned a previous generation of black leadership. The Young Turks and others also moved to address the police brutality and harassment that increasingly accompanied life in these two city wards. The second chapter documents several brutal clashes between African Americans and the police. These incidents engendered a loose coalition of Black organizations and a number of sympathetic white ministers. While police clashes occurred throughout most cities in the post-war era, the Rochester cases garnered significant attention for several reasons. In one case, the U.S. Justice Department interceded. In another case, famed Nation of Islam leader Malcolm X joined the protest efforts. For Black Rochester, these, these conflicts with the police 
created a sense of unity with diverse elements of the community. They brought together the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, who worked closely with Malcolm X and the local National of Islam leaders. But despite their success in rallying the Black community around the issue of police brutality, neither the ministers nor those activists, the Young Turks, were able to build a sustained movement. As such, Chapter 3 traces the eruption of the Black community in response to police brutality. On July 24th, one of the era's very first so-called race riots occurred in Rochester. As police were called to a street dance to remove an intoxicated young man, many bystanders who had had enough of aggressive police tactics struck back. What began as a response to police brutality ended as an indictment of the economic conditions in Rochester's ghetto. The three-day rebellion, which ended with the calling up of the National Guard, became a watershed moment in the city of Rochester. The moral economy of the uprising is also important here. With an impressive degree of precision, those in rebellion, men and women, youth and senior citizens, attacked the police and private property with a vengeance, but they exempted community institutions and stores with a reputation for fairness. When all was said and done, nearly 900 people had been arrested, 350 had sustained injuries, including the chief of police, and millions of dollars of property damage, of, of property had been damaged. But in the wake of Rochester's rebellion, an organizing frenzy began. A group of white ministers who had previously aided Black Rochesterians in their start struggle to create a police review board now expanded their commitment to the struggle for racial justice. Acting through the local council of churches, they joined forces, forces with Rochester's Black ministers to found and fund an organizational structure capable of building a Black movement. Chapter four then tells this story. It traces an abortive uh, attempt with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and a more successful one with Chicago's Saul Alinsky and his Industrial Areas Foundation. This leads to the formation of the fight organization. As fight continued to grow, they targeted the Eastman Kodak Company. The fight organization wanted to press the film, con film conglomerate to hire and train the hardcore unemployed. So what began as a local struggle jumped to the national scene in 1967, making major waves in the business world. Kodak, of course, had successfully avoided any type of labor negotiations for more than 80 years, a fact that made business executives envious nationally. So when fight came calling, the corporate leaders simply handled the organization as they had always done in Rochester. Kodak representatives explained their own programs and suggested that fight get in line. Not to be deterred, fight continued to pressure Kodak locally, engaging the media, and even drawing national black power leader Stokely Carmichael to join its efforts. As fight refused to budge, I'm sorry, as Kodak refused to budge, fight employed a newly emerging proxy strategy, persuading Kodak shareholders to apply pressure on the company. Publications such as the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times warned corporations that times were changing and that they should be aware of black power organizations such as fight. Under intense scrutiny, Kodak ultimately signed a working agreement with the fight organization. Shaken by the fight Kodak struggle, Rochester corporations endeavored to develop Black business opportunities in the city. Uh, one of the, the most interesting and pressing ones to develop in that moment happened with the Xerox Corporation, which is the subject of, of chapter six. But altogether, this book traces some, some 30 years of engagement and organizing in Black Rochester. No facet of life shaped Rochester in this period more than the emergence of a sizable Black population able to organize and, a command, and command the attention of City Hall and of the major corporations. By the end of the period, a telling diffusion of power had occurred. No longer could the corporations alone chart the city's course. No longer could the haves unilaterally prescribe a cure for the have-nots. And I think I have exhausted my time there for reading. I hope I've given you a brief introduction to the book. And I am very excited now to take your questions and to engage Kimberly in conversation.
And thank you very much for that, Laura. That was very interesting. I'm um, very, very excited to read the book today. Great. Um, I will check to see if there's any questions from anyone. Feel free to put the questions in chat or in Q&A. We will address those as those pop up. Um, and while we're waiting for that, I guess I'll start with my first question, which what which is what motivated you to write the book? Yeah, absolutely. So as I, I sort of alluded to in, in my opening, I know a lot about the 19th century history of, of Frederick Douglass. Uh, I knew a lot about uh, Rochester as kind of um, the burned over district. I knew about it as a hotspot for abolition. I had heard it referred to as the promised land. And I also knew a lot about the women's movement and how uh, both abolition uh, abolitionists and, and women's movement activists uh, were really sort of involved in in the Rochester struggle, and then the history just went went dead. <laughs> there was very very little written about what happened after that. What happened in the 20th century? And so, I grew up about 90 miles south of Rochester. I did my undergraduate work at at SUNY Geneseo, which is even closer. I did my master's degree at Brockport, and so when I needed a dissertation project. Uh, Dr. Emily Crosby, who was one of my undergraduate advisors and an activist there in the city of Rochester said, you know, there's this really incredible history that is just waiting to be told. Why don't you look at this project? And so I thought I was going to be writing about the 1964 uprising. And actually, what I ended up finding was that what had happened before and what happened after was far more important and substantial than the uprising itself. So that's sort of how I got involved in it. That's awesome. That's wonderful. It's all that all that way, right? We it is. <laughs> Absolutely. And then you're like, oh, right, I know about this. And now look, and that's yeah. how, and that happens Absolutely. to me all the time. Absolutely. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> how can educators utilize information from your book? So you talk about the 1964 race riots, and then you talk about what happened subsequently from that. You talk about how Rochester came to be. A lot of people being a part of that great migration, if you will, also coming here for employment opportunities. But how can, because I think you and I had an opportunity to talk a little bit before this started. Mm -hmm. a lot of this information is not commonplace. A lot of people don't know this. So, you Absolutely. know, I, the younger you are when you learn this, especially if you're native to Rochester, um, how can educators utilize information from your book without necessarily having to read the whole book. So say for absolutely who teaches middle school, this is yeah. necessarily something I would read with my middle schoolers, but I would love to utilize the information within. So absolutely, absolutely. So one of the one of the great projects that came out of writing this book is, the, is an oral history collection um, that was immediately, I, I, frankly, I worked on it with the University of Rochester. Um, Phyllis Andrews, who worked in the archives at the time, traveled all over the city with me. She recorded with me. She videotaped with me. Um, we archived every single interview that I did at the University. University of Rochester. And then the, the university transcribed many of those interviews and they're available online. So if somebody just Googles Rochester Black Freedom Struggle, they can actually, uh, they'll see the online project there and have access to many of the, the interviews. Um, for, for educators who want to give students, and I think this is even appropriate for, for middle school students, an opportunity to understand <laughs> what archives are are made up of um, all of all of the interviews again are at the archive but also Dr. Walter Cooper who I understand one of the Rochester City Schools is now named after was an incredible archivist he kept absolutely everything he had better records on the National Association for, for Colored People in his home than the NAACP had in terms wow. of their their records and he gave me access to all of those documents and we we were able to kind of facilitate uh, their being archived at the University of Rochester. So all of those documents are there as well. Uh, Minister Franklin Florence turned over a number of his documents. There are incredible images and pictures um, in, the, in the archive so that students could actually go in and look at pictures. I mean, this could be incredible for creative writing. It could be incredible for, you know, association activities. There's, there's just an incredible treasure trove of materials that are there. That is amazing. Um, I can't wait to share that information with my <laughs> and all of the teachers that I know. Um, Absolutely. I know 
magnificent social studies teacher who will probably love <laughs> information. Great. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat I see. So someone asked who led to who led the move to bring Sola Linsky? Yeah, so um, it was actually the National Council of Churches that reached out to Sol Alinsky. And specifically, well, I'm going to forget her name, and it is in the book. It's going to make me so mad that I forget this. Uh, there, there was a, a white woman whose husband was really engaged in politics in the city, and she actually... Um, was was sort of the local person who said let's let's get the national um, council of churches involved let's see what they'll they'll do they ended up donating i think a hundred thousand dollars and then there was this question about what are we going to do with this money who are we going to bring in and how are we going to do it like i said they initially wanted to work with the southern christian leadership uh, uh, Council, which was Martin Luther King Jr.'s organization, um, there was actually kind of a, a negative response to them in in the city of Rochester. Uh, the young the young people in Rochester didn't really want to hear "turn the other cheek." They were mad. They were fighting mad, and they really wanted something that spoke to their concerns immediately. And of course, the organizing that needed to happen in Rochester was really economic, right. and so. Ultimately, there, there was a decision made that SCLC wasn't going to work. It just it wasn't a good fit. They ended up working later in Chicago um, on Operation Breadbasket and, and other uh, projects. So when Saul Alinsky's organization came up, there was a lot of skepticism because Saul Alinsky is, of course, a white Jewish man. And many in the Black community felt like we don't need a, a white boy telling us how to organize our problems. Like we know what our problems are. We know what the issues are. We, we know how they need to get fixed. And I think at one point, you know, one of, it might have even been Saul Alinsky who said, right, but they're not going to give you $100,000. They're willing to give it to us. So let's figure out what we can we can do with this. And so they sort of reached an agreement and and leading this was was Minister Franklin Florence in Rochester. Mm -hmm. um, and he and Saul Alinsky agreed that Saul Alinsky was going to come in and and help them organize, but it was going to be the black community that made the decisions and it was going to be the black community that um, you know really sort of drove the agenda. And I think, uh, Kimberly, this is actually a good point to kind of return to your question about how this, this work and these ideas can be used with young people. Yes. The way that Fight organized was, was not like this massive organization that everybody belonged to. What they did was, was to become an umbrella of local community organizations. So if you and your PTA wanted to become a member of the Fight organization, you could. Uh, if, if somebody wanted to become a member of Fight and they weren't part of an organization, they could create a block organization where they organized their neighbors. They came together and said, what do we need on our block? Garbage isn't being picked up. The street light has, or the street sign, the stoplight has been out for you know weeks at the corner and it's really dangerous and nobody has come to fix it. This is an issue for us. And so now they have a block association and they can go to the fight organization and their voice gets magnified. Okay. And all over the city, everybody started forming these organizations that were really communal. I mean, really like located in sort of these grassroots problems and grassroots situations and they, they again were able to kind of magnify with the power of this larger organization. So just in terms of the way that they, they structured their organizing and their activity, I think is a really mm -hmm. powerful lesson for everybody. Absolutely. I think it's one that they can use as a model for today as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. So we do have a question in the chat, another question in the chat, and then there's one in the Q&A. So I'll do the one in the chat first. Sure. And they're asking, can you discuss more about how the moral economy played across the country as a strategy of resistance in the North and South vis-a-vis -vis uprising versus nonviolence resistance? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, what I'm best able to speak to is the Rochester situation. Um, there's a story in the book um, that an Olympian uh, from, from Rochester sort of tells. Um, Trent, boy, this is what happens when it gets to be eight o'clock at night and you're my age. Can't remember these names. Uh, Trent, I'm so, so embarrassed. I can't remember his last name. He, Jackson? He, thank Trent you. Jackson? It's Trent Jackson. 
He's an Olympian from Rochester. He grew up there. He's telling this, um, this story about being a kid and coming home from practice and stopping at Papa Mangione's store. And of course, this is Chuck Mangione's father. Um, and he tells the story about going in and he has five cents and he's looking back and forth between a donut and a cookie and he's hungry after practice and he wants them both. And Papa Mangione sees him and says, well, you know, you're, you're a good boy. You could have them both for five cents. There was this sense that Papa Mangione was of the community and for the community. His store was always open, even at dinner time. You know, he'd be sitting in the back with his family with the door open to the business and he'd have to jump up if somebody came in to take care of them. He treated the community with care and respect. And so when the uprising happened, there was very much a sense that this is not a place where we're going to touch, like we're leaving this place unharmed. But then there are also stories in the book of the exact opposite of shopkeepers who moved out of the community, who charged large amounts of interest when they used allowed people to buy things on credit. They wouldn't take uh, returnable cans from the kids. They wouldn't contribute to the sports leagues in the ways that local businesses frequently do. And so the community really felt taken advantage by them. And, and what they did then, what most people would call looting, was to really say, you owe us. <laughs> You've been taking advantage of us for years, and it is time that you pay us back. And Connie Mitchell and her husband, John, told the story when I interviewed them. And of course, they were kind of a, a community institution. The house was always open. There was always a pot of food on the stove. Anybody could come by and eat. Uh, and, and in the midst of the uprising, they, they tell the story about a bunch of young kids coming over with like gallons of milk and loaves of bread and like a side of meat. And they were like, you know, um, here, Mr. Mitchell, here's your share. Here's what, you know, we owe you kind of, um, you know, that this has to be divided out among the community because it's of and for the community. And so when I refer to the, the moral economy, it's really... Um, that people were judicious about what they destroyed and what they took and what they felt like they were owed. And that it was very much driven, not by a sense of chaos and destruction, but by a type of morality that operated in and amongst the community members. So I hope that answers the question. I understand where you're coming from. I'm not sure about the person who asked the question. I think um, we also- Yes, Trent Jackson, <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and we also saw that happening when, after um, the death of Daniel Prude um, as well. And there was lots of uprisings here in Rochester. So the businesses, you know, people were like, oh, they were looting and rioting and things of that sort. But that same sense of morality, that same um, idea of what's right and what's wrong in that moment was, also dictated by those connections to the community. Absolutely. So, Schools uh, weren't touched. The post office well, wasn't touched. You know, it was really just these businesses that had treated people horribly. That are, are very predatory in a mm -hmm. lot of in these great communities. Word. Um, all right. So we have a question in the question and answer box. Um, it says your book talked about the shared struggle and conditions of Blacks from diverse economic and educational backgrounds during that period because of their concentration to the third and seventh wards. You note that share reality as a factor that contributed to organizing success. So over the last 30 years, increasing numbers of black middle-class members have moved to surrounding suburbs and that share reality has lessened. Many economic conditions continue for blacks in the city of Rochester today. How do you think that has affected collective development for the black community in Rochester? Yeah, so this is, such an important question and it's it's i'm probably not the right person to answer the question mm -hmm. and i i'm not trying to dodge it i just think that there's something really specific that historians do and analyzing the past and looking at the past mm -hmm. and that when we start to talk about the present as a historian, I'm not trained to look at it with hindsight and to apply this, the skills that I have. Mm -hmm. um, I can certainly see that as people move 
into the suburbs, as their experiences and their realities change, they may not feel the same sense of unity Absolutely. on the one hand. <laughs> on the other hand, I think that we can all look at what's happened recently with cases like um, George Floyd and others, where regardless of where you live in the Black community, you, you're not untouched or unscathed or immune to police brutality. Um, mm -hmm. I was in uh, Rochester at a, at a homeless shelter interviewing a woman really late at night with my partner and with uh, a couple of other people that were uh, helping with the filming. We were a mixed crowd. Um, so some of us were white and some of us were black. And we came out of the building, the four of us around 11 o'clock at night. Um, it's quiet. There's nobody else on the street. It's just us. A police cruiser came around the corner and over their loudspeaker, they, they're blasting the theme song to cops. And so it's a residential area. There are kids sleeping, trying to get ready for school. They, I mean, I just, it, it was so unfathomable. We all kind of like looked at each other and the cop just so slowly went by and, you know, eventually drove out of, of sight and sound. And my partner and I went home and, and wrote a letter to the Democrat and Chronicle. And of course they called us right away to verify the details, which we, you know, gave and the comment section <laughs> to this was just absolutely crazy to me. I mean, every, everybody who commented was completely calling into question the veracity of the story. Like there was no way this happened uh, because we didn't get the, the police officer's badge number or car number. Like we were lying. I mean, it was a really strong and visceral response. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe one of the ways that we could think about what do we mean by unity today is how are forces lining up on both sides of the most pressing contemporary issues? And whether you're in the city of Rochester or you're in Brighton or Greece or Irondequoit, you know, as a black person, you are still facing these experiences. And, and as a white person or otherwise, you have to decide which side of this moral question you're on. You can't ignore it or straddle it. And, and so I think that there are ways to find unity across those modern questions. I think you did a pretty good job at answering that. Um, Thanks. It's always hard for a historian to talk about the present. <laughs> well, no, because history tends to repeat itself, especially if the lesson from history has not been learned. And I think we see a lot of that happening today. A lot of the things that are happening in current events, um, they mirror a lot of the past. So I think you did a pretty good job. Thank, Thank you. That's just my opinion. Um, we have another question in the Q&A that just popped up and it says, uh, your book discussed the response of the fight organization to the black middle um, wealth class that was in part created by Xerox and Kodak bringing African-Americans from within the respective corporations to Rochester. Can you discuss that further this evening? Sure, I'd be happy to. So uh, there was a, a group this actually was kind of the Young Turks that I referred to earlier. Um, a number of them were research chemists that were hired into Kodak. They had PhDs. In fact, they were um, they were kind of jokingly referred to as the PhDs, the Black PhDs, because there were so few of them at the time. Dr. Walter Cooper, of course, was one of them. Um, they worked very closely initially with the fight organization. Um, as time went on, their ideas about the most appropriate and effective strategies really differed. And so where when they were organizing around a single issue like police brutality, they had shared experiences and shared conditions, their response was united. As the organization after the uprising grew, as more resources and funds became available, there were really sort of ideological differences about how best to establish black rights, black human rights. Um, they, they really uh, believed in different paths. And so somebody like Dr. Cooper was really invested in education. Um, in fact, he, he started his interview with me talking about how important education was to his family and how that was the underpinning for everything that he had done in life. And 
And so that's really a direction that he wanted to pursue and sort of go in. Um, people like Minister Franklin Florence, who was a transplant from Florida himself, who started in a storefront church in the city of Rochester, really saw the most pressing issues as uh, economic racism. <laughs> you know, it was pretty simple. Like, it's nice, Dr. Cooper, that you've got a job at Kodak, but what about all of these people who can't get into Kodak? And I don't know if, if many of your listeners will know at this point, but to get into Eastman, you had to have a high school diploma. It didn't matter what job you were doing. You could literally be on a line, you know, using a screwdriver day after day after day, you had to have a high school diploma. And so with this new migration to the city of people who had been agricultural workers, many of whom, you know, had half a year's education, and many stopped out of school after the eighth grade, they just mm -hmm. simply didn't have that. And so it was a gatekeeping mechanism. It was a way of keeping the new African Americans coming into the city out of the corporations. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, folks like Franklin Florence said, this just isn't going to work. <laughs> you know, we have to tackle this issue and we have to tackle it head on. We have to challenge Eastman Kodak. Very difficult for the research <laughs> scientists who are employed by Eastman Kodak to take on that same strategy. And so there was some, some conflict over time. There was some tension, but ultimately there was enough space for them to form a number of different organizations where they could all sort of work in their own ways on a, on a, a shared vision, even if their strategies were different. Absolutely. Um, interestingly enough, I talked about history repeating itself um, <laughs> in an article most recently, and it talked about that happening today, whereas a bachelor's degree is now considered like a high school diploma, whereas before yeah. jobs, entry level and corporations and things of that sort, you needed to at least have a bachelor's degree. Now they're looking for master's degrees, PhDs and higher. So amazingly, you just see things continue to, you know, kind of that same, those same ideas perpetuate over time. Absolutely. Wow. So it's really sad. So I guess we got to come up with some new strategies to combat that because it, it really hasn't changed much over time. You know, we saw some progress and then you know, just new ways to absolutely press certain groups of people. Um, thank you very much for that. I have sure. a so in all of this, I was thinking about it, and um, just being that you are a historian and knowing a lot of the inner workings of um, the movements from the 1960s, you know, up until today, what advice would you give to today's activists to kind of re-energize the Black Power movement of the 1960s? Is kind of take some of those same ideals and apply them to today so that we can start to see more progress and some forward, move, more forward movement. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I, I, I do actually get frustrated with this sort of generational um, divides with, with folks from the civil rights era, um, you know, disparaging Black Lives Matter and their organizing strategies and the things that they're trying to do. This, we're, we're living in a completely different era. Things are entirely different. So I think we need to support the younger generation. I think we need to encourage indigenous leadership. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite activists from this period of time is, is Ella Baker. And it is precisely because Ella Baker, most people aren't familiar with her because she didn't imagine herself to be a leader out in front of the people. She imagined herself as a person who was training people how to get active, how to get involved, and how to get educated around the issues that affected their own lives. Um, you know, if you cut off the, the head of the snake, it doesn't grow back. Ella Baker understood that. She understood mm -hmm. that if you had many heads, there was no way to stop the movement. And so I think if we're looking for the lessons of that era, it is absolutely that we have to let we have to get out of the way of young people and let them lead. And we simultaneously need to show them how to be effective in their, their organizing and their community building. Absolutely. I agree. I definitely agree. Um, having that inter multi-generational connection and yeah. re-establishing community so that everybody's you know, talents and gifts can be utilized in the way that they need and to be able I to love that. <laughs> be able to mentor younger people, you know. I, I love that. To connect and mentor. So I love that too. Thank you so very much. So sure. mistaken, I think we're just about out of time. 
Um, and there are a couple more questions. So I was just wondering if there's any way people can reach out to you maybe directly, you have any contact sure. so that they could ask you questions or, you know, just in general. Absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and put my um, email address in the chat and folks can reach out to me. I'm happy to, you know, talk to folks. Um, I'm happy to share resources, anything that I can do to sort of facilitate other people's interest in this. I think it's super, super important. Thank you so much tonight for your time, Laura. Absolutely, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. That was really great. That was such an interesting conversation. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Laura Warren Hill, uh, Kimberly Brown, um, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, a video of this uh, event, uh, as well as our other readings, will be on our website. Uh, you can check that out, wab.org. Uh, buy the book. Link is in the chat. Uh, I also uh, want to thank our funders. And uh, I want to thank everyone for coming, and uh, have a great night. Thank you.